Hello, NF Geeks. This is Greg Scorzo coming to you from Leicester, UK. Um, I'm not coming to you from my home at the moment. I'm coming to you from my brother-in-law's house because our house for the last day and a half has had no power and hence no internet. And uh, if that hadn't been the case, you'd be getting this video a lot sooner. So uh, anyways, what I'm going to be talking about is an image that I posted online a couple of days ago, which has caused quite a lot of controversy not just in the NF Geeks community, but in the mainstream media as a whole. It's this image. It's an advertisement by Maria Kang, who's a fitness model and exercise instructor who's trying to induce presumably uh, mothers of small children to try and, uh, I guess, buy her services to become fitter people that she can help engage with possible exercises uh, with her and uh, your kids if you're the target audience for the... Um, advertisement. Um, the reason I posted that image is because it created an ambivalent reaction in me that I didn't really understand. I didn't really know what I thought about it. So I thought that I'd post it on NF Geeks to get a better understanding of what you thought, and I thought, well, if I can get an understanding of what you thought, uh, then maybe I can get a better understanding of what I think. And to my surprise, you guys gave me a thread which was over a thousand comments long. So, uh, in reading that thread, I actually did get a more clarified vision of what I think about the image. Um, so, as a tribute to you and your interesting thoughts, I thought I'd tell you what you taught me. So, uh, starting off, I wanted to mention something that Dr. Mike said uh, at the beginning of the thread, which I thought was insightful, which is, it's possible to project things onto this image that aren't really there. So, if you have some kind of psychological inadequacy about your body that's very extreme, or some neurosis that's quite extreme, or a paranoid streak that's quite extreme, you can mistakenly assume that this image is trying to get you to kill yourself. But obviously if you look at the structure and function of the image and all of the content, there's nothing in it which is trying to get you to kill yourself. So you can project things onto the image that actually have nothing to do with what's in the image. However, I do actually think that the image does have stuff in it. And I want to talk about what I think it does have in it that uh, you helped me to see. Uh, so, in order to do that though, I've got to first talk a bit about a concept called intentionality. Now, intentionality doesn't have anything to do with intending. It's a concept used in philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, epistemology, and phenomenology, used to describe the aboutness of our thoughts. So, for instance, if you think about a red bus, the only way that we can explain that thought is to say that it's about a red bus. If you think about a spider, the only way we can explain that thought is to say it's about the spider. If you think about something more abstract like love, the only way that we can explain that thought is to say that it's about love, right? So that aboutness of thoughts is intentionality. Now I'm going to give you a real-time live demonstration of intentionality in the works right now. This is a black umbrella. Now. Take a look at this umbrella for a couple of seconds, moving back and forth on the left and right hand side of the frame. Get a clear mental image of this umbrella if you can. Alright, now I'm going to take it out of the frame. Now, think about that black umbrella. Now that thought in your head isn't in any way at this moment perceiving an umbrella, but because of your memory banks, the thought is actually trying to grapple, in some sense, with that umbrella. Your thoughts are actually trying to get out of your head and reach that umbrella in some sense. Now, philosophers have written loads of material about what this sense is, whether it's a causal sense or some other kind of sense and how it works and so on and so forth. But it's a really amazing property of the mind that thoughts actually do this. They try and get out of our head. Uh, it's even more amazing when you consider things like the smallest planet in the universe, right? We all know that there's got to be a smallest planet in the universe somewhere, but nobody knows where it is and we're probably not going to find out in any of our lifetimes. And yet, when we hear that sentence, the smallest planet in the universe, our mind actually tries to grapple with that planet wherever it is, even though we don't know where it is. Uh, even more interesting and fascinating examples can come about if you think, for instance, of sentences like, the first baby born after 2019, right? We have no way of knowing who that baby is going to be, or who's going to have it, or when it's going to happen, or where it's going to happen. But there is going to be a baby, and our mind, our thoughts, in some sense, is trying to grapple into the future and become a kind of time machine, even though it can't really, because there's obviously a causal gap between us here and that baby that is in the form of a chronological sequence that hasn't happened yet. But 
What does any of that have to do with what's in the image? Well, if intentionality aboutness is what we have to use to talk about what our thoughts are about, then it seems reasonable to assume that whatever we create with our thoughts uh, that has uh, semantic content in it also has to have its own intentionality. It also has to be about something. So if you think of uh, works of art or movies or stories or images or advertisements, those things have to be about stuff in the same way that our thoughts are about stuff because they come from our thoughts. Now, what's interesting there is if works of art or advertisement or images or stories have intentionality, right, whatever they're about can't just be what we project onto them. There's got to be stuff in those works of art and stories and images that's independent of whatever we think is in them. And we have to be able to discern what those things are by looking at the structure and function of those artifacts, whatever they are. So I think because things like images and movies and advertisements have intentionality, this image has to have intentionality. It has to have something in it which is independent of what we project onto it. And that's something I think is, uh, at least in part, a political and ideological message. It's got other things in it as well, but I think it's very much uh, something that people are picking up on when they get outraged by it. Um, now, one of the reasons why I think an advertisement, a movie, a piece of literature, etc., etc., has to have uh, intentionality isn't just that, it's the only way to make sense of it, but there's an infinity of different ways that you can interpret any story or any film or any movie. Uh, well, films and movies are the same thing, but there's an infinity of ways that you can interpret any movie, for instance, like take 2001 A Space Odyssey, right? You could logically interpret that film as being about the Rafael Nadal, Novak Djokovic tennis match from 2011, right? There's nothing that logically implies that 2001 is not about that match. But we all know that that's an absurd interpretation of 2001 A Space Odyssey because there's nothing in the film that references that event, nothing that predicts that event, it, there's no tennis in the movie, etc., etc. So though there's no logical inconsistency between 2001 A Space Odyssey somehow predicting the future and being about um, the Nadal Djokovic tennis match, we all know that that's an absurd interpretation of it. Uh, Back to the Future, for instance, is not about the 1983 miners' strike. Um, Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ is not about Linda Lovelace's career in porn. Uh, again, there's no logical inconsistency between uh, those interpretations of the works cited and the works themselves, but they are ridiculous interpretations because those works have intentionality which exclude those interpretations. Those works are about things. And whatever they're about, they're not about the miners' strike, they're not about tennis, and they're not about Linda Lovelace, right? So this image, right, whatever it's about, I think it's not about an injunction uh, on the viewer to commit suicide. So then the next question becomes, okay, what is it about? Well, when I look at this image, I see two things. The first is it's encouraging women to become fit and exercise and become healthy. And it's trying to sell assistance in that regard in the form of selling uh, this woman's particular services, right? Now that, I think, is actually quite good. Some people have posted on the thread saying that they think this is quite negative because it puts pressure on women. I think that encouraging women and men to become physically fit is a positive thing. And given the problems that we have in the U.S. and the U.K. with things like diabetes and heart disease and obesity, encouragement for... Uh, betterment of the self on a physical level is uh, not just acceptable, but it's laudable. So that's the positive message in it. But I also think there's a negative message in it too. And the negative message comes from the juxtaposition of this line, what's your excuse, and this image. Now, how am I reading those two things together in a way where it creates a negative message? Well, this comes down to something called conversational implicature. Now, Conversational implicature is another idea in normally philosophy of language, but sometimes it's used in other branches of philosophy and logic and linguistics as well. And what it means is the logical implications of a particular utterance or sentence or phrase don't exhaust the meaning of that utterance or sentence or phrase. So although this line, what's your excuse, right, it doesn't imply anything about how you should be logically, um, if it's used in conjunction with this image, 
I think it does psychologically communicate a message. And that message is that you don't have any excuses for not looking like this woman if you've had three kids of this age. Now that, I think, is quite a bad message. Now, why do I think that's a bad message? Well, because I think that there are a diversity of different body types that all fall under the umbrella of healthy. I don't think you have to look like Maria Kang in order to be healthy. I don't think you have to be a fitness model with toned abs uh, the way that she does in order to be healthy. And furthermore, I especially don't think you have to do that after you've had three children. Um, and for some women, to try and reach that level of fitness after having three small children might be somewhat dangerous. Um, so to say that women don't have an excuse not to look like Maria Kang, I think uh, is really a form of bullying. Um, the reason it's a form of bullying is because there's nothing wrong with not looking like Maria Kang. Whenever you criticize someone for doing something that there's nothing wrong with, uh, in a way which invokes feelings of disdain, where you're trying to get the person who is the target of your criticism to feel ashamed as a way of motivating them, then I think um, that is a classic uh, example of bullying. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is a response to that idea, which came from somebody on the thread called Chris Earls. Now, Chris, if I'm misinterpreting your argument or not giving a, a charitable rendition of it, you can correct me on the subsequent post after this video. But uh, the argument that Chris gave, as I understood it, um, was that it's unfair to blame this image for those people who would read it as shaming them because it's not actually targeting the people that would feel ashamed by this image. It's targeting people that it would motivate to actually uh, want to become fit and possibly use the services of Maria Kang, right? So that idea, as far as I understand it, is if you create an image that motivates a certain group of people to do a good thing, that's what you should interpret the image as being responsible for. If you, by the same token, see other people looking at the image who feel like it's shaming them, you should just say, well, that's not the target audience of the image, and you can't blame the image for that result in those people because that's not who the image is trying to reach. Right? Now that's, I think, a very interesting idea. It's not something I would have thought of on my own, so thanks Chris for posting it. Um, but it's one that I nonetheless disagree with. Um, and the reason I disagree with it is because I think whenever you try and motivate somebody to do something positive by putting down somebody for an unjust reason, I don't think that's ever morally acceptable. So, in a way, I think it doesn't really matter if the image winds up motivating lots of women to become physically fit, because the way that the motivation happens is you have to have a disdainful attitude towards people who don't look like Maria Kang. Uh, if you see yourself as potentially being one of the people that don't look like Maria Kang, you become motivated so that you can do everything you can to look as much like her as you can, so as to not be one of those people that uh, has you know, the bogus excuse for not looking like her. So I think this is a classic example of uh, bullying through media, and the fact that people have a problem with it and are getting livid about it, I think is a good sign that media literacy is rising and people are becoming better at actually seeing through messages that come through the media all the time, which are not just examples of bullying, but also sustain uh, reactionary elements of society that we need to challenge. Um, so that's the second thing I want to talk about. I think that this image, apart from being an example of bullying, actually sustains and reinforces to other aspects of society and social pressure on women, which are really, really bad. Um, the first is the idea that in order to be idyllic, in order to have kind of the ultimate existence as a woman, in order to have it all, as it were, you have to look like somebody who can be sold as a commodity uh, in some form of media for men's sexual pleasure. So you've got to look either like a model or a porn star or somebody, you know, standing next to a car in a bikini, or else you just, you know, you're not that interesting. You're not that cool. Um, that's a message I think that we see uh, in the media all the time directed at women. Um, and it's so heavily entrenched in Western culture that we don't even notice it. Um, and I think images like this play up to that, because they're not just selling health for women. They're selling this idea of health being tied around, looking like a fitness model, looking like somebody that you can sell uh, in some product that men will buy, uh, because the product arouses men. Um, 
and I think this is very, very bad um, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is who you are should be what you're celebrated for as a woman. It's what people should be most excited about when they think of who you are. It's your attributes, your character virtues, your mind, your uh, heart, your all the things about you that um, you put into the world that present the world with your values and your aspirations, that's what people should be reacting to when they react to you, not primarily what you look like. Uh, otherwise, you know, we have a society that disproportionately treats women in a very shallow way, and that's not cool. Um, that's something I think men should be just as upset about as women. But there's another thing about uh, that which I think is really terrible. And that is, it gives a completely uh, distorted conception of what sex is. It makes sex look like the sort of thing that only happens if you've got a woman between 20 and 35 or 18 and 35 who looks like Maria Kang. And if you've got a woman, you know, who's 65 and a bit flabby or 70 or whatever, it can't happen, right? Now that's just completely empirically false. Women over 70 have sex all the time. Uh, and the reason that they can do that is because of something that exists for all women in all the phases of their lives. And that's this, right? If you walk into a room and you're very, very attractive, you will create a big arousing impact on most of the men in the room in all likelihood. But if you're not very, very attractive and you walk into the room, you can actually talk to the men and you can change the way that they perceive your body, right? So you can actually come into the room feeling very, very average and then by behaving a certain way, leave the room, the most attractive woman in the room, right? Now that's something that all women can do at all ages, and that's the reason why women at 70 or women who are not stereotypically attractive can actually have good sex with men who enjoy sex with them. It's because how you behave as a woman actually changes the way that men perceive your body. And that's the way that lifelong, you know, wonderful, healthy sexual relationships between adults happen. It's because no matter how your body changes chronologically as you age, or whether you get bigger or smaller or wrinklier or whatever, you can always behave in a way which makes you erotic to your partner. And that's the element of sexuality that's the most important. That's what keeps it going throughout a lifetime marriage. It's not whether or not somebody has a visual appearance that when they walk into a room, you know, everybody gets really excited. Um, it's about behavior primarily. That's what sustains good sexual relationships. So this idea that women, you know, are at their most uh, idyllic and have it all when they look like models and porn stars and famous actors and so on, I think it's not just a misconception, but it's a, an unfair and reactionary pressure on women to achieve something which has nothing to do with what um, is actually uh, healthy for a woman to try and achieve. Sorry, Jeff Miller, I used that word healthy. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is the second uh, bad social idea that floats around a lot, and we see it in practice in a lot of media that this image reinforces, and that's the idea of children as something like accessories. So if you look at this image in the way that it's laid out, right, this woman has her children in the photo in a way where the individuality of her children, the burgeoning personalities of these three babies, it's not really terribly important. What's important is that their existence in the photo makes her social status go up. The fact that she can look the way that she looks and have these kids is supposed to make her look really great and that's all really the children function to do in this image. In this image, um, it's to raise the social status of the mother. Now, what's interesting about that is it's actually very similar to the way women themselves are used in a lot of images and media. You know, you see women, for instance, on uh, cars and bikinis next to some rich guy in the car, and that's supposed to sell the social status of the man. Now, I think that this is particularly bad uh, in relation to the way that we portray children uh, because I don't think uh, children are accessories. I don't think they're like handbags of purses. I think they're proto uh, personalities. Uh, maybe you can even say they have personalities of a sort uh, that you can type. Um, and given that they are humans with personalities and individuality, they should never be used as an accessory to raise the social status of an adult in the image. In much the same way that I think a woman should never be used uh, to raise the social status of a man in an image uh, via her sexuality. Uh, why do I think those things, uh, as weird as they may seem to some people? Um, I suppose I think those things because I think we need to live in a society which views people comprehensively, in which we 
give the greatest amount of kudos and interest to people for who they are, not what they look like, or not what social status they happen to, uh, I don't know, uh, give to other people because of the way that they function in images. Um, so, anyway, that's my thinking on this image, and that's uh, much of what you inspired in your thousand comment long thread, which uh, I'm still trying to digest. Um, so anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Sorry it was a little long, but then again, your, you know, thousand comment post was a little long, so I thought, hey, you know. Um, anyways, uh, from what I can see, Dr. Mike has a new video on ethics and morality, and uh, Dr. Mike's NF Geeks videos are, I think, our household equivalent of crack, and uh, I'm in need of a fix. So, good night, NF Geeks.